Good afternoon. I'm Brian Pascoe, Chief Executive of ICMA. And I'd like to welcome you to this virtual ICMA and Nordic Capital Markets Forum event on digital currencies. It's a great pleasure to be working again with colleagues at NCMF. I believe this is the sixth in the series of annual conferences which, which, we, which we have delivered jointly. The Nordic region is very important for ICMA with close to 40 member institutions based here across the entire range of market participants, including central banks. ICMA has a strong regional structure which supports member firms in organizing themselves to meet and discuss issues that are affecting them. The Nordic region is a particularly dynamic and active one under the chairmanship of Johan Wikström, and I would like to thank Johan and to the regional committee for the great work that they do. The digitalization of finance is an area of great significance for our diverse membership at ICMA, which covers public and private issuers, investment banks and central banks, asset managers and other investors, as well as market infrastructure providers, among others. As part of our overall strategic interest in fintech, we closely monitor new fintech solutions coming into the fixed income market across primary and secondary activities and in the repo space. ICMA's fintech directories cover over 300 different solutions, and this number will only continue to grow. Within this, we look to identify and promote common standards and to support automation, interoperability, and innovation, which is a key priority for ICMA and its members. And increasingly, these solutions and the need for more efficient use of data intersect with the ESG space, which is also a key area of focus for ICMA globally, and notably in the Nordic region. Regulation will also be fast evolving, and ICMA has a key role to play working with members to ensure that this supports effective and robust market development. Innovation in the debt capital markets comes in many different shapes and forms. Automation of processes, use of machine learning and data analytics to support investment decisions, new trading protocols, and enhanced functionalities across asset classes in operations. For an operational, from, a, from an operational perspective, common standards play a key role and while not just limited to DLT itself, ICMA's common domain model for repo and bonds lends itself to D DLT applications that rely on common standards. The application of DLT, tokenization and digital currencies to capital markets is the most transformational area of technology and digitalization initiatives. Policymakers and regulators around the world have adapted laws and regulation to pave the way for blockchain and capital markets. We are seeing an increasing number of pilot programs on digital bonds, but to unlock the full potential of distributed ledgers, it is important for digital cash to be available, amongst other factors. We are keen to raise awareness on the impacts, how this impacts on market functioning, and help our members prepare for it and understand how digital currencies will influence central bank operations. So far, only a few central banks have introduced or are in the process of introducing digital currencies but quite a number are in the process of exploring if this is an appropriate move for them and how it might be best done. This brings us very neatly onto the subject matter of today's event, where all of these important issues will be covered. Firstly, we look forward to our first and keynote speaker, Peter Erstby, Special Advisor of Norges Bank, who will talk about progress with the Norges Bank Digital Currency Project. Following this, ICMA's Gabriel Kelson will moderate a broader panel discussion on digital currencies and their adoption. And finally, Gabriel will hand over to Soren Plesner, board member of NCMF, to provide closing remarks. I very much hope you enjoy the next 80 minutes. And with that, I hand over to Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, introduce myself. My name is Pedro Espi and I work in the Payment Analysis and Innovation Unit at the Central Bank, where I mostly work on regulatory aspects of digital currencies. And I'm also heavily involved in our CBDC project, which I'm going to talk about today. Let us first dwell a little into what a CBDC is. What kind of money creature is a CBDC? Money, they can be categorized in many ways. Uh, and this is a category, categorization that conveniently put CBDC in the middle. Uh, you can distinguish money as to whether they are electronic, whether they are widely accessible, and whether they are issued by the central bank. 
and a CBDC is a type of money that is uh, intended to satisfy all those uh, criteria. And more precisely, what we are looking into is a retail CBDC, which is a widely accessible electronic uh, means of payment um, issued by the central bank available to everyone. So in, in simple sense, you can say it's like um, digital, digital cash. Um, we have many other types of money as well. We have bank deposits, which is mostly used for payments in Norway. This is widely accessible, but not uh, uh, issued by the central bank. Just uh, to be brief, we also have another type of C uh, CBDC that many central banks look into that is called wholesale CBDC, uh, which is sort of a tokenized version of central bank reserves, which can be used uh, for, for instance, um, settlements uh, of securities. Uh, many central banks have looked into um, pilots in this respect. Uh, and I guess that is also the CBDC that is most re relevant for, for the members here. But to be clear, we are looking into a retail CBDC. Norges Bank is not alone in uh, considering CBDC, as uh, you all know. Uh, BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, they make a yearly survey of how central bank look into CBDC. And as we see from this picture, very many central bank has have uh, some project in this area. Some are looking into retail CBDC as Norway, some are looking into wholesale, and some are looking into both. Uh, also have a term called general purpose CBDC, which is a CBDC that can be used for both uh, purposes. Let me tell you a little about our project in uh, Norges Bank, uh, uh, illustrated by a timeline. We started seriously to look into CBDC in 2016, where we established a working group in the central bank. Uh, in the first phase, which lasted for about one year, we looked more high level into purposes, consequences, and possible technologies. And then in 2017, we went into phase two, where we looked more carefully into the purpose of a Norwegian CBDC. Uh, we looked into necessarily and desirable characteristics of a Norwegian CBDC and possible technical solutions. Uh, and then in phase three, we continued our work. Uh, we used our previous um, uh, characteristics and we did some proof of concept sort of uh, analysis where we more from an analytical and a desktop perspective looked into whether technical uh, uh, solutions could meet our characteristics. And we also have other projects analyzing the consequences of, of CBDC, and we're also preparing a basis for technical testing. And this phase uh, ended in uh, about May 2021, and all these uh, three phases have resulted in public uh, reports available on our web pages. Right now, we are in phase four, uh, where we are doing further analysis. We have started our experimental testing. Uh, during our investigation, we have had a lot of dialogue with stakeholders, and we will continue to that. Um, uh, so this is a very interesting uh, stage for us. And what is this phase four going to result in? Our plan is that in, uh, in um, June 2023, we will be able to recommend if the central bank should proceed the work on CBDC uh, and what kind of solution that should be tested for uh, implementation purposes. But I would like to know that, uh, like to to say that it's not only up to the to the, the central bank whether CBDC should be introduced. That might need or that will need uh, political support and possibly legislative amendments. And uh, just a brief sketch of how we work. Uh, everything we do flows out our mandate, which uh, is in the central bank act. Uh, and that is financial stability, price stability, and an efficient and secure payment system. And based on that mandate, we have identified purposes for CBDC in Norway. 
And from those purposes, we have derived characteristics. And uh, the question for us now is which technical solutions that are suitable to meet those uh, characteristics. So since this, uh, this uh, conference is about digital currencies, I have a couple of slides on the relation between CBDC and cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. And uh, a question is, what is the difference between CBDC and cryptocurrencies? Uh, and I would like to say that there are some uh, fundamental differences here. Uh, CBDC is a measure to promote the goals in the Central Bank Act. And as I said, that is price stability, promoting financial stability, and promoting an efficient and secure payment system. Uh, and that will be uh, the purposes that guide our uh, CBDC work. Uh, cryptocurrencies, on the other hand, they can serve various purposes that might be more or less related to uh, to a CBDC. Some cryptocurrencies might look might look more similar to CBDC than others. For instance, stable coins that are properly secured might look more uh, like a CBDC than a free floating cryptocurrency. Uh, also, CBDC must satisfy a range of characteristics that are not satisfied by cryptocurrencies. There are some obvious characteristics. For instance, a CBDC uh, must be a claim on the central bank, which uh, cryptocurrencies are obviously not. But there are also other uh, characteristics that uh, you will not uh, find to the same extent in cryptocurrencies. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, inclusion and uh, available availability to disabled and things like that are things that must be satisfied by a CBDC. And also we think that it's necessary to, for instance, uh, provide offline solutions for uh, contingency purposes. Also, a uh, major difference is that CBDC offers ultimate settlement in central bank uh, money. And you that are working with uh, capital markets know that uh, uh, central bank money has a, a crucial role uh, in settlements, it's the ultimate means of settlement. Mm. Uh, so that's also a difference. But that doesn't mean that uh, coexistence is not possible. Uh, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, and so on might take different roles. They are innovative, can, can provide new solutions. Uh, but I think at least that the role of cryptocurrency depends on regulation uh, among others. Another question, if it is, if the technology behind or characterizing cryptocurrencies are relevant for a CBDC, should a CBDC, for instance, be based on blockchain? At least we can think that uh, that potential elements of DLT or blockchain technologies can be utilized for a CBDC. Uh, we can have uh, some sort of uh, decentralized functions, for instance, some validation functions on a CBDC that can be formed decentralized. But maybe the most uh, relevant uh, technologies are the cryptographic, cryptographic primitives and the programmability, programmability that uh, satisfies, that characterize uh, cryptocurrencies. They might also uh, be useful, utilized on a CBDC for instance, to, to utilize the benefits of smart contracts without uh, CBDC as such being a decentralized system. It can be centralized and still satisfy those um, uh, functions. Uh, another issue that has uh, arised is the potential interaction between CBDC and public or permissionless blockchains such as Ethereum. Uh, some have uh, have uh, suggested that the CBDC maybe could be issued on a public blockchain. Uh, we don't think that the technology is mature enough for that uh, now, but uh, who knows what happens uh, in the future. Uh, it's also possible that the CBDC might somehow be transferred to a public uh, uh, blockchain by wrapping them 
uh, and, uh, and using them there. Uh, in exploring these issues, there are certain trade-offs. Of course, we want CBDC to satisfy the user's demands and the demands uh, the new functions that, uh, that the public need from money, but we also need to remain governance and control. Uh, for instance, uh, is there any, some governance issues that will arise if we let uh, CBDC to float on a public blockchain as a uh, abrupt CBDC, for instance, but these are issues that we are looking into. So then I was finished uh, and I look forward to this discussion afterwards. Well, thank you, Peter, for this extremely interesting keynote on Nordisk Bank's CBDC project. It is indeed a fascinating topic and digital cash issued by a central bank has significant, has significant potential, as we've heard, and would have far-reaching implications not only from a monetary policy perspective, but more broadly. And this is a good segue into the panel discussion on digital currencies from the perspective of the Nordics and the implications for capital markets and beyond. Now, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Gabriel Carlsen. I'm responsible for FinTech at ICMA and I look after ICMA's FinTech Advisory Committee. And I'm delighted to welcome a panel of experts from the European Commission, Bloomberg, the Norwegian Block Exchange, and our keynote speaker from Norges Bank. So I will now ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Matthias Levin. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Matthias Levin. I work for the European Commission's uh, financial services arm, so TG FISMA in common parlance. And we are tasked with kind of maintaining uh, and managing the EU's uh, fairly extensive uh, financial services legislation, with a particular emphasis in my case of uh, digital finance legislation. Great, thank you, Matthias. Now over to Liv Freyhau. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Liv Freyhov, I'm the um, Chief Communications and Public Affairs Officer at Norwegian Block Exchange, which is a cryptocurrency company uh, currently operating in exchange here in Norway. Great, thank you Liv, and over to Mike McLone. Thank you, Gabriel, and um, thank you for having me. Mike McLone with uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. I'm a commodity, stra and commodity and cryptocurrency strategist, and one thing I like to um, add to this panel is I'm completely neutral in my outlook and analysis that I publish for Bloomberg terminal users. And this is part of the trickle down that I really enjoy just showing what my research and outlooks um, views are on markets. So thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Mike. And we also have our keynote speaker, Peter Asby from Norges Bank, who we've just heard from. So clearly digitalization across capital markets is on the rise and there are different strands. There is on the one hand process automation using technology to make processes simply more efficient. There's a broader trend towards electronic trading across the different segments of bond markets. But there's also digitization of securities where blockchain is used to represent an instrument and change the way it is traded and settled. And this has implications for market infrastructures and intermediaries and can lead to disintermediation. But to realize the proclaimed benefits of blockchain, digital cash is a key factor to unlock the full potential of the blockchain revolution in capital markets. But as we've heard, there are many different forms of digital currencies, most of which are outside capital markets. And I will now turn to our panelists. Mike, the, the spectrum of digital currencies is arguably very broad. What are the main types of digital currencies from your perspective? What are the differences? And can you give us some market insights so I like to clarify what we are looking at here. These are, we, the term cryptocurrencies, I think is not correct. Speculative digital assets covers the vast majority of this, about 17,000 coins you see on coinmarketcap.com. And then there are some things that really matter. The most widely traded crypto assets are what most people call stable coins. I call them crypto dollars akin to Euro dollars, which came out of the um, Cold War 50 years ago or so. 
crypto dollars are stable coins that essentially they all track the dollar. So let's call them what they are. I mean, there's a de minimis amount that might track the euro, the yen, and the yuan. And through this token technology, most notably through Ethereum, people can transact, transmit, and transport dollars without a bank involved 24-7 and earn interest. It sounds to me like the next layer of euro dollars. Now, we have this issue of central banks trying to launch CBDC, central bank digital currencies. To me, it's already happened organically, digitally, and on a free market basis through digital tokens. And as Peter said, regulation is the number, thing, number one thing that has to happen. So I like to point that out when I give presentations. I gave one recently to a, a university in Florida, and they were unaware of crypto dollars. They think of things like Ethereum and and Bitcoin and um, Dogecoin and things like that. So I'll end with this. I look at the market as there's three musketeers. There's Bitcoin. Bitcoin started every, everything. It's clearly on pace to become global digital collateral. That's a fact. My, my job is to just extrapolate in the future. Will that trend stop? I don't think so. It's replacing gold. It's becoming a complement to bonds and stocks. So that's a fact that's been happening. The question we might ask ourselves, does that end? And then there's things like Ethereum. Ethereum is becoming the, basically the foundation for um, decentralized finance, i.e. NFTs, crypto dollars, stable coins as some call them. Every one of these crypto dollars I'm aware of trade on uh, Ethereum tokens. NFTs, if you might have heard of, which is quoted as a word now by Collins Dictionary, they are mostly all based on Ethereum. So what you're seeing here is a revolution in finance. And what I see is happening now is a major significant Cold War where China's pushing back and banning things like the um, mining of Bitcoin and trying to create their own CBDC because they have to. And one of their biggest problems is they, they, they have to pay for everything in dollars in terms of commodities, yet the dollar's dominance is increasing globally despite the fact the U.S. proportion of GDP on a global basis is declining. A lot of that's happening through digital assets, digital currencies. And to me, this is something now that's become the significant part of this Cold War. And the U.S. is in the middle of this great debate, and my optimistic view is the U.S. isn't going to mess it up. It's going to see what's happening. What you're seeing, I'll end with this, is there's votes, there's revenue, there's tax, there's um, jobs, and it increases the dominance of the dollar in the U.S. security. With that, I pass it back to you. Thanks, Mark. I think that's a very interesting perspective, in particular the parallel to euro dollars and the use of stable coins that apparently is increasing and is used to, to make transfers without the, without, uh, the need for, for banks. Clearly, I think this is something that is probably outside our traditional remit at ICMA, but the question is really, how does it, how does it interlink with capital markets? But before we come to that, Peter touched on that, you touched on that as well. Regulation has an important role to play. And Matthias, from your perspective, what is the EU's approach to digital currencies and crypto assets? Thanks, Gabriel, for, for, for a very good question. And thanks also to Mike for setting the scene so well. Indeed, there's a flurry of activity out there uh, that uh, happens largely outside the kind of uh, traditional regulated perimeter with a lot of experimentation uh, enabled and uh, trying to uh, exploit the potential offered by crypt cryptography and blockchain. And when we start looking at that, uh, we start seeing such activity in Europe as well. We start seeing an interest from our reg national regulators into kind of looking at this space and seeing what can be do, can be done. So, from a kind of European perspective, what I thought, what we thought was important was to kind of provide clarity uh, about the rules that apply in this fast moving area in order to kind of provide a kind of a framework for these markets to take off on a sound basis. So that we can all kind of uh, exploit that potential and the potential, yeah, in terms of efficiency, for example, new opportunities, et cetera, that comes from uh, the increased use of blockchain cryptography in this uh, vast and very heterogeneous space, uh, free musketeers, uh, you, whatever, whatever you label it. Huh? But what we also quickly found out was that uh, some of these crypto assets, perhaps a better term than cryptocurrencies or digital currencies, some of these may actually qualify as kind of traditional financial instruments, security tokens. And there, actually, we're fairly confident that they fall within the financial services uh, legislation that currently exists. However, many, if 
probably most crypto assets do not. And that we really kind of observe the kind of a clear lack of legal certainty. So what we want to do is to provide a framework for those crypto assets falling outside. So that's what we've done in this so-called Mika regulation, which is currently running its course here in Brussels in, in terms of being negotiated. So what do we include within that scope? Well, it's the digital currencies you refer to, the kind of payment tokens, the kind of stable coins of this world. So those crypto assets that are backed by something. Uh, but then also we have a kind of broader range of crypto assets that we include as well, the kind of non-backed crypto assets. So they aim, as I said, a clear framework of one set of rules that would apply to the single market here in the EU. So there we try to uh, have proposed a framework that uh, imposes rules on issuers of crypto assets where they exist, as well as rules on those uh, firms that would provide related services, be it wallet services, broker services, trading services, uh, custody services, you name it. Huh? And the aim, the fundamental aim of that is to kind of address our traditional kind of key policy concerns, which we have seen, and we do see a need for also to do in crypto markets, be it to protect consumers, to protect the integrity of markets, to ensure financial stability as well in this market that is now growing, has been growing very quickly for the last few years, and also to address concerns, uh, clear and manifest concerns about mon money laundering, for example. But in doing so, uh, of course, one thing we could have done was just basically copy paste the existing financial services legislation we have, for example, securities, trading and stuff like that. But that clearly doesn't work. So here, while we have, of course, been inspired by mainstream regulation, what we try to do is adapt it to the particular nature of these assets and adapt it to the risks that we see in this space. And to have a kind of a risk-based approach where we kind of have a more stringent requirements, perhaps for those instruments that we believe are more likely to be taken up on a big scale, like echoing the, uh, what, uh, what Mike said before about stable coins in particular. And in doing so, we have also strived to kind of implement international recommendations. So what we see in, in the Mika proposal, for example, is that we stick very closely to recommendations of a financial stability board and uh, the financial action task force when it comes to money laundering issues and the like. Yeah? So this legislative proposal, we tabled it last year, is currently being negotiated here in Brussels. Uh, Council has adopted its negotiation stance. Parliament still has to do it, but we're hopeful that that could be an agreement before the summer and hence the rules starting to apply in a few years time. Great, thanks, Matthias. I think that's again a very interesting perspective. And what I take away from your from your comments is that legal clarity is really important to provide a framework, and um, for these type of digital currencies and crypto assets that currently don't fit in the existing one. Now, question to to live from your perspective as a market infrastructure operator for digital currencies, what are your views on the regulatory framework? Is it fit for purpose, and how does it impact your business? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, for, at the time being, well, we're all waiting for Mika to be implemented and we don't expect that to, you know, be uh, completed for another uh, couple of years, at least. We are living in a land of limbo when it comes to um, regulation. In, uh, in the case of the company I work for, for example, um, NBX, we are registered with a Norwegian uh, financial um, the FSA, but there are very few regulatory requirements that are placed on us, apart from anti-money laundering. Uh, for example, there are no specifications as to how uh, our customers' funds should be stored and secured on our platform. Um, so, you know, as an as an exchange, we take this very seriously, um, and security is our number one priority. But it would, for the industry as a whole, I think it would really be helpful. Um, if there were legal requirements and regulatory clarity that everyone had to meet. Um, it also creates, th so this lack of clarity creates uh, problems for us because we are a part of a greater financial ecosystem and we're really dependent on other parts of this ecosystem to, for, to deliver the reliable services that we want to, to deliver. So, um, for example, it makes banks and other financial institutions reluctant to engage with us in some cases. Even the issue of granting companies in the crypto space a bank account has been difficult. Uh, you know, you can't, it's very difficult to operate without a bank account. 
Um, another example is letting our customers use gains from investments in cryptocurrency as collateral in a housing mortgage. That can be problematic. And, um, uh, you know, if we had greater regulatory clarity, I think that would make other institutions that we're dependent on um, less reluctant um, and more secure in engaging with the crypto industry. Great. I think this is these are important aspects that you highlight. There's of course the the desire by by regulators and policymakers to provide a framework, but of course it takes time. And you've highlighted some of the the issues that you're facing. I think this links to the question though to, uh, about the broader risks. It comes back to the risks of digital currencies that are not issued by a central bank. Peter, you touched on it already, but what are your your broader thoughts on those risks? Thank you for the question, and it's a very good and very broad question, so I can address it in different ways. Uh, one way is to look at it at a very high level, and I think uh, at a fundamental level, uh, a risk is associated with that they are not issued by a central bank, and they provide no guarantee for a certain convertibility into certain to central bank money at a, at a given value. So for those that are dependent on that, uh, for instance, in capital markets, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's a risk to point on. Uh, also at the high level, uh, we also have to, uh, to realize that they do not provide the, the, democra the democratic governance uh, by law that are uh, characterizing central bank money. Uh, and they do not share the purpose of a central bank money, uh, such as price stability and financial stability and a secure payment system and so on. Uh, if we kind of go into more details, we know that uh, digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, they, they pose some risks to, to both the users and, uh, and uh, the society more broadly. Uh, for instance, users, they might risk to lose their money. They might uh, risk that the value uh, falls and the, there are also technical risks. And we have also seen concerns about, you know, financial stability, environment, uh, and so on. Uh, but I will not uh, go into detail here. Uh, and I also don't want to end this too negative by just pointing at the risks because uh, there are also uh, some benefits. Uh, so I don't want to be too negative. Uh, digital currencies, they provide some innovation that uh, the private sector is uh, most uh, suited to provide. Uh, so so uh, I think that even though they cannot uh, provide all those functions that CB uh, central bank money can serve, they can serve other functions and uh, combined with regulations and uh, accountability principles, they can uh, perhaps live well uh, together. I think the important points, as always, I think there are different coins to the metal. There's the risks that you mentioned, but there's also the benefits and the purpose of digital currencies. And I think this brings us back to the broader question, which is, to what extent are digital currencies really relevant for capital markets? And the question here is, is the rise of digital currencies only a retail phenomenon? Mike, from your perspective, how do you see the linkage to capital markets, the risks and opportunities there specifically in our segment? I think we have all heard about recent developments around exchange traded products that are based on crypto, crypto ETFs or futures. Well, let's start with um, what you ended with, exchange traded products. They are proliferating in Canada, in Europe, most notably Switzerland, which you probably know much better than I do. These are products that track um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And the U.S. is far behind. Um, but one thing that did happen, the U.S. did launch, uh, approve an ETF that tracks Bitcoin. What does that do? It's a massive cash and carry trade. Now, I'm from futures markets, so your average person can hold Bitcoin now, say they have a million dollars in Bitcoin, sell futures and roll those futures and make 10 to 15 percent virtually risk free. 
this whole no notion that of um, Bitcoin going to zero will cannot happen. I used to structure these positions for clients. So that's what's happening. This means there's massive flow in that space until it's arbitraged out. And the way I look at it, it's just a matter of time that these exchange traded products become exchange traded funds in the US and they track a broad index of crypto. So here's the an issue in this country is we're still the SEC is still pushing pushing back on the ability to launch ETFs on Bitcoin because the products available right now are very um, poor, poor way to track Bitcoin because an average person can buy Bitcoin, put it into the savings account and earn an additional seven, eight percent on that. I mean, there's risk, obviously, but there certainly is plenty more reward. So what's going to happen, I think, in this country, if the SEC is true to their word about protecting investors, we will get to a point where there will be an approval of an ETF in this country that tracks physical cryptos that track an index of cryptos, which is what most institutions want. They don't want to just try to pick winners between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Give me an index like the S&P 500. That's a matter of time. The Bloomberg, and based on um, kind of my guidance, we launched the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index in 2018. That was our end goal. Now it's about four years on and we're getting there. To me, that's where it's going. It's a matter of time. And the significance is it's a, it's a big battle in the U.S. because funds are now leaving the country for Europe and the U.S. Um, Fidelity, the world's one of the largest asset managers on the planet, just launched just, just um um, launch an ETF in Canada. Why? Because they have to. What does that mean in the States? It means, oh, we're falling behind. Um, Kathy Wood of ARK Investment is now have money flowing to Canada to track this space. So everything I hear on the Bloomberg terminal with its you know, numerous um, subscribers is this, this is a demand pull environment and the banks are falling behind. They're catching up. But everything I've heard for two years now is we're getting in the space because clients are asking us. So a key thing to I'll, I'll, I'll like to conclude is if you look at um, crypto dollars, Visa and MasterCard, the most widely traded second layer ways to just, you know, to transact in dollars on the planet, are starting to utilize them, and they've said they are. Why? Because it's just a better way to transact. You don't have to wait for the weekend <laughs> to clear your your dollar balances. You don't have to wait and uh, for a weekday, and then of course you have holidays over the country with different banks. So it's just a better way. It's the you know it's the car replacing the horse, and as Peter said, there, there's there is um, you know they are decentralized. They need regulation, but the unique thing that's happening, it, it's all code. And it's, it's, it's open source, so, well, like Bitcoin's open source software. It's taken over the world and there's, you know, freedom of speech rules. It's a question I like to say is, and my point is, why take the risk of falling behind? Just embrace it with proper regulation. And that's what I usually say to asset managers. They ask me about, why are you so bullish Bitcoin? I'm like, what's your risk? If you don't get involved, you don't want to be the next blockbuster or next Kodak. Who did invent the digital camera? With that, I pass it back to you. Thanks, Mike. That's a very interesting perspective um, to see how regulation is shaping activity or is kind of pro providing opportunities for some activity for the launch of products that are based on ETF and where we see the how capital markets and, and crypto markets come together. Liv, from your perspective, do you see digital currencies becoming mainstream, investable assets for institutional investors? Well, I certainly agree with Mike, you know, the um, ETFs will be really key in institutional adoption of cryptocurrencies. So, and the short answer to the question is yes, um, I do believe that um, digital currencies are on the path to become mainstream and investable assets also for institutional investors. Um, but last year, we saw some major institutional uptake, you know, famously with Tesla MicroStrategy. And in Norway, here we have uh, one of our uh, really uh, industrial giants, Orkid, um, an old Norwegian uh, industrial company, uh, invested about 57 million US dollars equivalent uh, in Bitcoin last spring. Um, and uh, parallel to that investment, they, they also um, set up a company to invest in um, Bitcoin ventures and crypto ventures and products and, and companies in that space. Um, just you know, a few days ago, KPMG announced that they have invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So definitely, that that part of industrial uptake is happening. And then when it comes to pension retirement funds, I the feeling I get is that most are still on the fence, uh, waiting to see how this will play out. Um, many 
have formal investment parameters that don't allow uh, investments in crypto, uh, in digital assets, and very afraid to, you know, make the wrong move here. Um, but my bet is that we'll see much more institutional involvement as the industry matures and as ETFs become more prevalent. Um, and at some point, like Mike said, you know, the risk involved in excluding digital assets from a properly balanced portfolio is greater than, than the risk of, you know, embracing it and making it part of um, a, diver a diversified investment portfolio. Right, I think that's, uh, of course, uh, another important perspective in terms of risks, a different view on the risks of not becoming involved in, in crypto, but making it part of a, of a portfolio. And on that note, perhaps, do you see a link between the inflation expectations and, as we know, central banks around the world are now starting to, to increase interest rates and the volatility of digital, of digital or cryptocurrencies? Um. Well, so, you know, a huge part of the Bitcoin narrative has to do with it being a hedge against inflation. And um, during the pandemic, when inflation was really rising um, in the US, especially, um, that had a very positive effect on the value of Bitcoin. Um, lately, uh, you know, the the... I don't know, the past few months, we've seen that crypto markets are moving in a similar pattern to high risk or growth stock equities. But in my mind, the crypto market is still so young that it hasn't really found its very you know, distinctive pattern yet. And you can't say exactly how it will correlate with other trends happening out there, like such as inflation, interest rates. So I would say there are dependencies between crypto assets, the movement of crypto assets, um, and for example, inflation, interest rates, and other equity classes, but not a direct correlation. Okay, so it sounds that the, the jury is still out. But on a related note, if we go back to the retail CBDC project, Peter, from your perspective, What are the, the implications or the link between retail CBDC for wholesale capital markets? Um, thank you for the question. I would just like to say that I came into this field as a, from a technology regulation perspective. So I'm no expert on capital markets uh, myself, uh, but I can say that uh, on a high level, Uh, there are at least not many intended implications for the capital markets since we look at the, uh, an, uh, a retail CBDC. Uh, but of course, uh, there might be some effects still, uh, and they might also involve some risks that we have to, to look into. Uh, and uh, that... Uh, that um, That is related to that uh, CBDC can affect financial stability and monetary policy in, in different ways. For instance, uh, if we offer a, a retail CBDC, that might change the consumers and others' composition of assets. For instance, uh, some might choose to hold CBDC instead of bank accounts, uh, and that has... Uh, some implications also for the, the capital markets. Uh, we don't want from our perspective to, for, for CBDC to be uh, disruptive, too disruptive in this sense. So we don't want uh, CBDC if introduced to cause some concerns for financial stability. Uh, another sort of indirect uh, implication is that uh, if, we, if we look at the uh, Even if we look at the retail CBDC, uh, the technology is also relevant or can be relevant for a wholesale CBDC. And maybe we could imagine that uh, a retail CBDC could be more used as a general purpose CBDC and uh, then be used for a, as a wholesale CBDC. And then, of course, that could uh, provide some uh, fundamental changes in how settlements are performed. Uh, for instance, there are many pilots going around in the world now on wholesale CBDC and what benefits uh, uh, tokenizations can do for, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, making settlements more efficient. Also, and 
now I underline that I'm speculate, and this is, uh, um, you know, this uh, this must be taken carefully. But uh, some, at least, researchers, academic researchers, have have uh, have uh, pointed out that if you have a CBDC, you could perform monetary policies in other ways, and uh, if monetary policies are performed in other ways, that could also affect uh, capital markets, but uh, I'm not uh, competent, uh, competent to, to go into the details of the mechanisms here. Yes, thank you, Peter. I think these are interesting insights. Of course, I think what I take away from your point is that CBDC is not designed to be disruptive in that sense. There are, there's potential for some crossover. You mentioned settlement, for example, with wholesale central bank digital currency, and I think this brings it back to, to our space, to capital markets. And of course, the digital cash or the cash lag is a very important aspect to ensure how, how securities are transacted, uh, to ensure, for example, in a delivery versus payment scenario. And there we can now look at, again, what, what, the, what regulators are doing to support the digitization of the securities lag. And this brings me back to the, to the EU's approach, Matthias. If you could tell us more about the, the rationale behind the EU's DLT pilot regime, its objectives and what we can expect from it in the future. Okay, no, sure, absolutely. I mean, we, the DLT pilot is a bit the, uh, it's very complementary to, to, to Mika, uh, what I, I mentioned before. Same ambition, clear, and in this case, workable rules, that rules that actually fit and, uh, and work in practice. So here we're kind of uh, back in the space of trying to provide regulation for the uh, crypto assets that actually fall within uh, the realm of financial instruments, so so-called security tokens. And hence, they are currently subject to kind of mainstream financial services regulation in the trade and post-trade field. Uh, so what we've tried to do there is that uh, the clear feedback we got from the market uh, was that there's some of these rules that somehow seem to prevent the full application of the potential offered by blockchain. Uh, and therefore, uh, in order to learn more and know more, we decided to kind of uh, set up a, a kind of a pilot regime, uh, which is a uh, regime aimed at uh, a temporary regime aimed to gain further experience of the benefits of DLT for issuing, trading and settling securities on dis uh, using distributed ledger technologies. So what this regime will do, it will kind of enable market participants to request permissions to set up dedicated DLT market infrastructures to kind of trade and settle security tokens. And they would also be able to kind of seek time limited exemptions from specific provisions in EU financial services legislation that have been found to hamper the use of DLT. Uh, and that will then kind of allow uh, the market to experiment more with DLT issuance and uh, for us to learn more. This would be subject to safeguards. So there are kind of limits on the eligible, eligible instruments, there's size and volume caps, and there are some kind of compensatory measures uh, for uh, to kind of compensate for the regulations, the provisions that have been uh, disabled. And uh, but we think this will be very interesting. It will allow us to kind of evaluate the regime and it will inform uh, our reviews of the kind of baseline laws, be it MIFID or CSTR and the like. Yeah? And of course, yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned Gabriel and Peter as well, uh, the settlement of a, of a cash leg is very important. We know uh, that currently in the absence, uh, the DLT pilot uh, regime for the time being will have to operate in the absence of kind of wholesale CBDCs, kind of traditional emphasis on kind of settlement in central bank money. We'll have to find other kind of workable solutions and the DLT uh, pilot provides for such workable solutions. But of course it would be ideal if one, if one could enable a fully kind of digital uh, settlement of the payment leg as well. And that is something where we observe there with a lot of interest these experimentations that uh, Peter referred to. So just in terms of timeline, but I think that was your, your question as well, Gabriel. Uh, there is now political agreement. So uh, these rules uh, will now be rolled out and will be fully applicable, uh, fully apply as the beginning of the next year, 2023. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. So it seems like it is now in the pipeline. It is something, a framework that is available for market participants to test DLT in a, in a framework 
that's provided for the EU uh, where securities can be represented on a blockchain. As you mentioned, there's the question around the, the cash lag, but there, there seems to be progress or, or options, let's say, um, to, to achieve that, um, as we heard. Now, another topic when speaking about digital currencies, which is inevitable, is to touch on sustainability, as digital currencies are often criticized for their excessive energy consumption. Question here is, is this true for all digital currencies? And will it hamper their uptake, in your view, uh, Liv, from your perspective? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So this, in my mind, is um, a really serious issue that affects our whole industry and, and the role of our industry in society also. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that there is you know, a huge energy consumption associated with mining and maintaining the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and it occurs, it, it's, it's complicated, but it occurs because the method that's used for securing transactions involves thousands of computers or servers doing the same computational work in, in a race to mine a block. And that's called proof of work. Um, so Ethereum, which is the second largest cryptocurrency out there, also uses the, this method, um, but they've announced that they will switch to a much more energy efficient system called proof of stake uh, later this year. So we're waiting for that. And a move to proof of stake um, will signif really significantly reduce the, the footprint of, of the industry. Um, so that's that's the state of, of, of affairs, basically. Um, on the bright side, so much of the energy that's used for mining is green and is renewable. Um, and there is a case also for mining actually driving both the use of energy that otherwise would, would not have been used, um, and also for development of new renewable product, energy production. But I think we also have to face the fact that um, it also mining also consumes fossil-based energy and scarce energy that has many alternative uses. And I think, especially for people who don't understand crypto and, and blockchain, I really understand that this seems provocative, this energy is issue. Um, and I, I think it's something that we as an industry as a whole need to, to work together on and take seriously and just commit to finding better solutions for. Thanks, Liv. I think that that is clearly an important issue. Um, Mike, from your perspective, you know, looking at the market developments and the activity there, what are your thoughts on, on yeah. the question of sustainability? I think I think Liv's um, handled it very well. It's one of my favorite topics. It's what happened to this old human um, thing of what humans do is we harness energy to improve the human condition. <laughs> That's kind of what's happening. And it's one of those things that when you've been in this space for a while, once you do your 10,000 hours, you realize that I've dug into uh, met energy producers who had no clue what Bitcoin was, and they got to Bitcoin in the States because it helps moderate their production. It's a giant governor. It's actually very complementary to the system. Number one, first of all, the mining of Bitcoin, let's start there, works very well with renewable sources, i.e. that intermittent power source. I um, mean, what just happened in Texas was a great example. There's oftentimes a lot of solar and wind excess production, and we're not up to speed now with proper um, storage. So what do you do with that excess production? You either shut down or you do something with it. And Bitcoin mining helps moderate that. That's what I heard from a power producer uh, that I met a few years ago. He said, we only got to Bitcoin because it helps moderate our grid. So what happened recently, they had this big storm coming and they had all these agreements, all the Bitcoin miners shut down. Boom, it was done. They, didn't, they were happy to just let that power go to where it's needed. And it's happening that way globally. And so it's such a complement to the system. Um, so that's what's happening. And it's also really accelerating that transition to renewable sources. A good example is I, my home in Connecticut, which I'm selling soon. I have solar panels. My son was running, running a Bitcoin node. Um, and it was just you know, part of that network. We kind of had to test it. But that's the key thing to remember about using um, energy. Is it about... Um, Improving the human condition, harnessing energy, or is it just people blaming? Well, this appropriate, this is appropriate use of, of electricity, and this isn't. That's 
probably not for certainly in the United States, that doesn't play well. So one thing I'll, I'll leave you with, it's really happening in the natural gas flaring process. That's a big problem. For instance, like in Iraq, they probably flare almost twice as much natural gas, I heard, that the state of Texas uses on a normal annual basis. What is happening now is those flares, that flaring, that wasted energy is now being converted to very efficient generating sources and, and it's producing, it's helping to, um, um, they're using it to mine Bitcoin. Um, and that's happening everywhere. It's happening in Canada and it's just getting early days. So it's adapting to the new technology and understanding really what it is and what it does. And another example was I had a, a good power producer I, I met who he, uh, when NAFTA was passed, there was a number of massive amount of U.S. textile manufacturers that left the Appalachian Mountains. So they had all this extra power from hydro. It's just being wasted. He put in his uh, Bitcoin miners and they love them there because they're, they're taking advantage of most notably electrician energy sources that are very um, desolate and hard to transport to cities. So it's one way to look at it, but it's also a fact of what's happening. It's actually helping the system moderate the system, helping accelerate the process of going to um, renewable sources. So it seems like it's a question of efficiency, how to bring together renewable resources on the one hand and then the, the crypto activity but the question, of course, is, is this going to be good enough? Um, Peter, from your perspective, do you, do you believe that regulatory inter intervention is required? Uh, thank you for the question. Let me first uh, note that this is so, sort of a difficult uh, topic to be debate because, because uh, the debate seems to be quite polarized in this issue, which in itself is a little bit problem because it kind of disc can discourage a, a reasonable debate. Um, so I, I'll try to be very um, technocratic here uh, from a sort of technocratic perspective. You can look into if you should intervene in, into this, why should you intervene? Uh, what one, one approach to this is to look as, as if there are market failures, are there risks that are not accounted for and so on. And a related approach is cost benefit, but that's also uh, very difficult because uh, there tend to be very much disagreement on both the cost and the benefits. Some things that uh, no energy should be used on this and uh, some things that much more should be used on this, for instance, to secure the Bitcoin's uh, network even more. Uh, I'll just have a few topics I, I like to raise. The first is that um, I, heard, I hear the arguments about uh, using environmental friendly energy and so on. Uh, but we must also remember that uh, Bitcoin is, um, is uh, at least designed to be permissionless. That means that you can enter with the energy you want, whether it's risky or dirty, into, into the, the mining. So we, we must kind of uh, remember that this is a kind that this is in Bitcoin nature. I think it's also important to take into account in this cost benefit analysis, as Liv pointed out, that there are alternative validation mechanisms. So maybe you can achieve the same uh, with the less uh, environmental impact. Uh, but uh, I realize that this is very subjective. Um, this is an area of very subjective assessment. So we need a, a good dialogue here. I think that there are many approaches to take. And uh, this could be coordinated international, internationally and um, each country could take their own view on this. Some might uh, tax more, some might even subsidize. Some might think that banning is a good idea as has been suggested by some. But there are also more kind of intermediate uh, solutions that have been uh, pointed out by s some, uh, someone. And that is to kind of uh, design a regime where you have compensating taxes, uh, for instance, that you tax, for instance, either the holding of a cryptocurrency or the transaction themselves. Uh, but uh, uh, on a more high level, I think that this is an issue that needs and it's very important to be explored. And I hope that it's kind of the, uh, that it can be a good debate and informed debate about uh, how this should be regulated. This seems like a very balanced approach, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Matthias, what, what are your views on, on what's been said? Anything to, to add from your perspective? 
I think that Liv, Mike, and Peter have already said the essential. I mean, coming last, I can perhaps try and sum up in the sense that we we do see uh, there is movement in the market. Uh, it's not all all assets are not the same, and uh, I think that uh, also we have uh, currently uh, such a kind of a climate emergency that one will have to kind of look at uh, all sectors to see what they can do to kind of contribute to uh, to becoming more efficient uh, in energy terms. So I think that from our perspective, we very much want to continue to kind of nudge the market in that direction of becoming more energy efficient. And in doing so, I think also from a kind of a, perhaps a policymaker perspective, uh, one can uh, have both a kind of a micro assessment, a kind of a more macro societal assessment. I think indeed uh, we, all, we also hear from, the kind of micro perspective, power producers, et cetera, that uh, there are ways of kind of uh, uh, unspent energy uh, at certain points of a grid, et cetera, that can be, be used and uh, that would otherwise uh, just uh, not be consumed due to lack of storage, et cetera. But of course, the question is whether such a system is effective. And from a societal viewpoint, I think the idea would rather be that we try to address those things and then we have to, I guess as policymakers also look at a little bit, what do we want, uh, connecting back to what Liv said about scarce energy resources, what do we want these energy resources to be used to, especially as the kind of technologies differ and there are technologies here in the crypto as a space that consume much less energy. So from our perspective, as we kind of set out in our sustainable finance uh, strategy uh, last year, uh, we want to look at this. We uh, we will assess the sustainable impact of digital finance technologies. Uh, we believe uh, we, that we should make these infrastructures climate neutral and energy efficient uh, by 2030, actually. And therefore, we also have this taxonomy instrument that we believe is a kind of a key instrument to kind of uh, ensure that the market uses sustainable crypto assets. Uh, and we've done so in the past by uh, including for uh, data centers in the taxonomy uh, uh, as well. So as I said, to try to nudge and build the momentum that is there in the marketplace to kind of further nudge it in that direction. But of course, we also have that now as part of a kind of a Mika negotiations debate. Great, I think that fits in the broad narrative around the, the risks and opportunities of cryptocurrencies and I think, and digital currencies. And clearly I think sustainability is one of the, the key issues that will um, probably attract further further scrutiny as this, this sector evolves further and how it perhaps then um, becomes becomes more of a mainstream um, mainstream asset class and becomes perhaps part part of capital markets in the future. Now this brings me to the well, to the conclusion of, of our panel. And clearly I think there are opportunities and channel and challenges lying ahead. And I would ask each of you to give us your advice how to prove uh, how to future proof your organization or your business model. Back to Mike. Oh boy, you're gonna start me with that one. Okay, so I'll do my best. And my 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 main um, focus is um, like Liv and I kind of uh, mentioned is from a prudent money management standpoint. I look at this space from a money management standpoint. The greater risk. If you look at the bell curve of naysayers, has been shifting every day towards those who are not exposed, and there's still um, it's about one percent of global um, equity value now is in cryptos, uh, not in cryptos, but is related to that. And I look at it as very simplistically from a global money manager looking at something like Bitcoin that has declining supply by code you can't do anything about, increasing price and ad increasing adoption and demand price must go up over time. So I look at it as a money manager, I might as well allocate a sum portion of that versus the greater risk of me not being involved with what's becoming global digital collateral. Now it's clearly replacing gold. So I, that's my bias is might as well not fade or fight the rapidly advancing technology. And it's one of those things is no Zell like a convert. Once you learn more about this space, and I've been involved about 10 years, I, every day I read about it, I initially was a, you know, I didn't agree. I thought it was silly internet money, internet money, but as a commodity guy, I see what's going to happen in crude oil, natural gas with this spike in price. We're going to have massive supply reduces demand, prices go back down. That doesn't happen in Bitcoin. It's not happening in Bitcoin. So I say, might as well allocate, don't fight to it. The number one thing that's happening in this space is crypto dollars and 
do we really think the U.S. is going to mess that up? I just think it's very silly. Once they, they're going down the rabbit hole, they're understanding what this technology means. It's, it's, it's as significant as the Internet. And how did we get, you know, sure, we had some major fluctuations. Capitalism is, can be very messy, as can democracy. But you get to the end game organically. And that's why I think crypto dollars are dominant, will continue to dominate. It's just making the world a better place, a better way to transact. And I'll end with this. What's happening now? It's this major communist country that's becoming more and more of a dictator is pushing back on this rapidly advancing technology. I was shocked they did that. China is very much one of the biggest miners of gold on the planet. They're hoarding gold for uh, as a, a reserve asset. I figured they would just you know, diversify and seize the miners, but they didn't. Now we have the rest of the world saying, okay, well, let's adopt the technology and watch it advance. So to me, the greater risk is, is falling behind and becoming a blockbuster. Hey, thank you, Mike. I think this is a, a very clear message. Um, Liv, from your perspective, what is your advice? Well, I agree with what Mike said. You know, um, about six months ago when I made the switch from, I was working in tech policy for many, many years and and made the switch into the crypto industry, there were a lot of raised eyebrows. Um, and I think people didn't really understand why I would want to make that move. But to me, we're at the cusp of something really, really big and huge that will impact uh, the whole financial services industry and um, and you know the the information age uh, stage two, I think. So uh, the risk of not being involved or not trying to learn or understand is so much bigger than than you know closing your eyes and because this is not the end game is not known, but but um, learn as much as you can. Um, I just think it's a super interesting time for anyone working in the space, whether you're an investor, um, a regulator, a journalist covering the markets, um, if you're an exchange or another company working in the space like us, or even if you're an incumbent in financial services operating a bank, um, it's still early days and everyone is trying to find their way, all of, all of us working within this ecosystem. So it's um, very difficult to uh you know say that you have the answers as to what will happen in the future the that is uh, unknown to everyone i think um but i would say as an investor you you need to think long term i would not look sort of quarter to quarter in this space um because everyone is trying to build for the long for the long term developing products and services as the um whole space matures um but yeah, if you're not already involved in some way, I would definitely advise you to learn as much as you can and, and uh, jump in. Great, thank you, Liv. Matthias, from, from your perspective, what is the advice that you would like to, to give to the audience? Advice to the audience, you know, it's, it's a good question. I was thinking more of an advice for myself, but uh, or, no, I <laughs> or for yourself, of course, <laughs> people no, in, your, uh, in your position, let's say, as exactly. Uh, no, I, I would echo a little bit what, what Liv said in the sense that uh, technological innovation is a bit of a humbling experience, but also very much what, uh, what, what Mike and Liv, and Liv also said that uh, uh, these assets they are they are here to stay. Uh, we have to. Uh, uh, make the best of them and they offer a lot of interesting opportunities from a policy making perspective they certainly also come with things that we need to think about and challenges we need to address so that's also perhaps connecting back to uh, to lives uh, uh, at least my words put on it and uh, the need for a certain uh, humbleness in that respect uh, we uh, are here at the forefront of digital innovation uh, any regulatory response that we develop of course we have to be mindful of the fact that that things develop very rapidly uh, I, I look at the not so distant past when we tabled Mika, which was September 2020. It's not that long time ago. And I think that the market cap of crypto at the time was uh, around 300 billion US dollars. Now is a bit uh, 
dangerous to kind of uh, venture numbers in this space because it changes quickly. But I'm sure Mike has the most up-to-date number, but it's far away from 300 billion. That's, we're speaking trillions for the time being. And that, of course, just to give a simple message in the sense that the market is developing rapidly. And of course, we as regulators have to be mindful of them and look at the things which are coming. And there, of course, there are evolving themes. We have touched some of them on the panel today. Uh, we see a very strong evolving link with the... Uh, the crypto asset ecosystem and a traditional financial ecosystem. We have to think about that. I think there's a strong interest there. I can understand that interest, but we also have to think through the consequences of that. Decentralized finance, very interesting. But of course, from our perspective, if you don't have an intermediary, how do you regulate it and supervise it? Not because we just love regulating and supervising, but just in case things go wrong, which sometimes I happen to do in financial systems. So a lot of uh, interest, by all means, do get involved, but be mindful of a new uh, the new uh, uh, category that this is, and that uh, your old traditional responses and reflexes may not suffice. Great, right, thank you, Matthias. And now for the final then uh, advice uh, over to Peter. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, very much clever things have already been said, so I don't have so much to add. It's, it's difficult for me to sort of give uh, advice to the industry, so I kind of have to give this uh, paternalistic advice to uh, comply with law and regulation and be responsible. And I think this is a uh, little more than a cliche because I think that for the industry, being responsible uh, is crucial for the kind of broader legit leg <laughs> legitimacy of the, um, of the industry and acceptance. So I think that's crucial. And I also have... <laughs> also sort of an advice for myself and the central bank. I think that the central bank serves a, a very important function in promoting price stability, financial stability, and promoting an efficient and secure payment system. And I think it's important uh, for a central bank to be robust for the future, be agile to accommodate the future so that we can provide this uh, service uh, to the public now and in the future, whatever may come. Great, thank you, Peter, thank you. For, for, for these words. This now brings us to the conclusion then of the panel and to the Q&A session. So first of all, I would like to, to thank you for, for your participation in the panel and for sharing these fascinating insights. We have received a number of questions, as I can see here, uh, nearly 20. And I believe that we may have uh, answered some of them in relation to sustainability, for example, or the use of um, the energy consumption. I'm just looking at them here. Um, some have been addressed again. There's quite a few relate to sustainability. One question here, for example, we have a few minutes left, so I would take this question, which is how can platforms or regulators justify non-CBDC digital currencies being used as collateral when they are not asset-backed and are not immediately realizable. I think the, 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 the response comes from the question itself, I, I guess. Uh, it's uh, to qualify as collateral, you have to have certain kind of characteristics. And of course, can certain crypto assets uh, qualify as collateral? Yes, if certain characteristics are met. That's why, for example, we, uh, when we regulate uh, stable coins, we focus a lot on the kind of uh, making sure that the kind of stabilization function is kind of credible and uh, realistic and ensures a kind of a stability in, uh, of the value and that you also have uh, to respect certain rules about redeemability. Uh, and if those conditions are met, I think then you can start having a conversation about uh, it being collateral. Otherwise, I guess it's difficult. I, right, I, can I can touch on that one a little. And I'll just add to that. There's the most significant crypto dollar, people like to call them stable, is Tether. It's number three in terms of market cap and um, on coin market cap and most of the lists. I've heard the pushback in Tether for four years. I was in Hong Kong in 2018. And one thing I learned there was Chinese left. <laughs> They want to get access to the dollar. It's a better way to do it. Asians, if people don't have easy access to the dollar, it's like, hey, there's give me a better way. So the thing about Tether, it's very controversial. The New York attorney generals come down on them. But the key thing I learned as a markets guy is when 
when the market doesn't care, it means something. It's because the world has found a better way. The, the thing I'll mention about that, there's a dozen wannabes who are doing the same thing. There's algorithmic crypto dollars that track the dollar via an algorithm. It's not really, it, they state we, we don't hold assets. We don't have to. We have algorithms that do it for us. It makes it, you know, increases supply or demand to make it pegged to the dollar. So this is part of, we have to understand this technology and embrace it and not push back and, and embrace it with proper regulation. To me, that's the key thing is the bottom line is your average person in this planet who does not have the benefits we have on this screen. And we're the Western elite. And we, we've, are there many of us missed our meal, me, meals in our lives? The rest of this world, this is one of the most ESG friendly spaces ever heard. E energy not so ever, not so much, but you're allowing the, the world's unbanked to get uh, assets to a digital asset in a world that's going digital. It's helping lift the whole level of the, of the planet and they can get dollars and they can focus the US and they can earn income. Sure, there's risk, but there's risk because every new nascent technology and that's why you don't for our state, you don't allocate your whole portfolio, but please understand what's happening here um, from a non-Western elite standpoint, who are now the rest of the world with people who have these and have more access to these than they have toilets on the planet are getting this exposure to this um, digital collateral. Great. I think this hopefully answered the question um, that was made. There are a few other questions, but I'm afraid that we won't be able to answer those now as we are coming close to the end of the panel discussion. And, and the event. So at this point, then I would like to thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the event. Also a big thank you to our panelists and our keynote speaker. Thank you very much.